We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1144, the beginning of our 22nd year of This Week in Amateur Radio. President Joseph Biden taps Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel as acting FCC chair. Ham Radio's Suitsat returns in a short science fiction horror film called Decommissioned. The QSO Today virtual ham exposition will include a speaker track on working amateur radio satellites. The Orlando Hamcation online event and QSO party is set alongside the Orlando virtual Hamcation, all happening very soon. Over-the-horizon radars continue to clutter up the 40 and 20 meter bands. Eris and partners are investigating the failure of the space station amateur radio system. Germany's Friedrichshafen Hamfest plans to take place within pandemic restrictions. And a popular television series featuring amateur radio is preparing to go QRT, the ham radio way. You're going to want to take some notes. We will have the story in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and see what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about bringing back forums. Leo also will tell us how Google is in the process of shutting down its wide area ISP experiment called Project Loon. And... He will tell us about a railroad system in northern China that is running on the now-expired Adobe Flash. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will introduce us to the Vagabond Ham. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to November 15, 1945. That's the date that radio silence was lifted and amateurs were allowed back on the air. Well, sort of. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present part four of his six-part series on writing and producing a written public service announcement to promote your next club event and to successfully get it on the air on local broadcast radio stations. And courtesy of Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, and the QSO Today podcast team, we will have a complete interview with former FCC official Ralph Haller and 4RH. All that and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where it definitely has been a three-dog night for the past few days, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in downtown Syracuse, New York, from Armory Square, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from Ice Station Zebra in the Catskill Mountains of New York, where the temperature barely crawled above zero degrees today, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Troy, New York, beneath a four-inch layer of new snow, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where this week in amateur radio celebrates 22 years of service to the amateur community, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the weather can't make up its bloomin' mind, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now, to start our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community, here's our lead anchor this week, Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Chris? Leading off this week's news, President Joseph Biden this week designated FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel as acting chair of the Federal Communications Commission. With more details on this important appointment, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. President Joseph Biden has tapped FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel as acting chair of the FCC. She succeeds, at least temporarily, former FCC Chair Ajit Pai, who resigned effective on January 20th. 
Rosen Worsell, who's been on the FCC for about eight years now, said she was honored to be designated as the acting chairwoman, and she thanked the president for the opportunity to, as she put it, lead an agency with such a vital mission and talented staff. Three other commissioners, Nathan Symington, Jeffrey Starks, and Brendan Carr, all had words of praise for the temporary appointment, although Rosenworcel could get the permanent nod as chair. Rosenworcel went on to say that it is a privilege to serve the American people and work on their behalf to expand the reach of communications opportunity in the digital age. Prior to joining the FCC, she served as Senior Communications Counsel for the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Before entering public service, she practiced communications law in Washington, D.C. The newest FCC Commissioner, Nathan Symington, a Republican appointee, said Rosenworcel brings deep knowledge and experience and highly informed judgment to her new position, and he expressed appreciation that the Biden administration acted promptly to establish FCC leadership by selecting such a distinguished public servant for this vital role. Fellow Democrat Jeffrey Starks said Rosenworcel has been a passionate advocate for bringing the benefits of broadband to all Americans, particularly our children. He said her designation as acting chair comes at a critical juncture for the commission, as the pandemic has made bold action to end internet inequality more vital than ever. The commission's other Democratic appointee, Brendan Carr, called Rosenworcel a talented and dedicated public servant as evidenced by her eight years of distinguished service at the FCC. On Twitter, Rosenworcel said, The future belongs to the connected, and she described herself as an important optimist, mom, wife, and an inveterate coffee drinker. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Suitset One loses its innocence in a new video short sci-fi thriller entitled Decommissioned. Inspired by true events, the video short resurrects the 2006 spacesuit and satellite that transmitted messages on two meters as it circled Earth. The original Spacesuit One project, conceived by an amateur radio on the International Space Station team, repurposed a decommissioned Russian Orlan spacesuit to function as a free-floating amateur radio transmit-only satellite. Eris designed and built an antenna and radio gear that got approved for installation into the suit, and cosmonaut Valery Torkarev and commander Bill MacArthur, KC-5ACR, put SUITSAT-1 into orbit at the start of a spacewalk. Eris U.S. delegate for ARRL, Rosalie White, K1STO, recounted. SUITSAT-1 transmitted a voice message. This is SUITSAT-1, RS0RS, in several languages, plus telemetry and a slow-scan TV image on an eight-minute cycle as it orbited Earth. In the six-minute film, a SUITSAT returns in the future to haunt International Space Station Commander Diaz, played by Joey Vieira. Diaz is seen taking photos from inside an observation dome on the ISS when he spies some distant space debris and radios Houston to express concern. If there was any cause for alarm, you know we'd see it too, Houston assures. As the object closes in, an increasingly anxious Diaz recognizes the debris as SUITSAT. This is suit set, comes a voice on the ham radio. Houston, you're not going to believe this. We're picking up transmissions on the ham radio that sound identical to the suit set experiment, he tells a skeptical mission control. It's suit set. I'm seeing suit set. Suit set re-entered the atmosphere and burned up years ago, mission control responds. It's impossible, he is told. Decommissioned was produced by Perception Pictures and directed by Australian filmmaker Josh Tanner. He told Gizmodo that he produced the video using the Unreal Engine technology that The Mandalorian used, albeit old-school rear projection, as opposed to the fancy LED wall tech they used. Suitsat 1, 
called Radio Skaff or Radio Sputnik in Russian, was so successful that another unneeded Orland spacesuit was subsequently refitted as Suitsat 2. As an interesting sidebar with respect to the real Suitsat, White explained, after the Eris engineers calculated Suitsat's one orbit and spin characteristics, they knew the legs and arms would have to be filled with something, so they asked the crew to stuff dirty laundry inside. White said decommission was a hit at a recent Eris meeting. The original Suitsats were deorbited to burn up in Earth's atmosphere after their useful lives ended. ARRL is a partner in the Eris program, which has kept amateur radio on the air from the International Space Station for 20 years. A hallmark of the ARIS program is the scheduled ham radio contacts made by astronaut crew members with schools and student groups around the world. Some of you might not be old enough to remember SuitSat from the early 2000s, but it was a Russian spacesuit that was equipped with a radio transmitter to transmit on two meters. Anyway, SuitSat makes an appearance in a new video short sci-fi thriller called Decommissioned, Inspired by true events, the video short resurrects the 2006 spacesuit satellite that transmitted messages on two meters as it circled Earth. The original suits had one project, conceived by an amateur radio on the International Space Station team, repurposed a decommissioned Russian Orlan spacesuit to function as a free-floating amateur radio transmit-only satellite, transmitting a voice message, this is SuitSat-1, RS0RS. In the six-minute film, a suitsat returns in the future to haunt International Space Station Commander Diaz, played by Joey Vieira. Diaz is seen taking photos from inside an observation dome on the ISS when he spies some distant space debris and radios Houston to express concern. Houston, you're not going to believe this. I'm picking up transmissions on the ham radio that sound identical to the suits I experiment. And that debris? It's an Orland spacesuit. I'm not sure I'm hearing you right. Repeat that, Commander? Suit set. I'm seeing suit set. You're mistaken, Diaz. Yeah? Decommissioned was produced by Perception Pictures and directed by Australian filmmaker Josh Tanner. You can get a link to the video on our website, www.arrl.org. Look for the story, Ham Radio's Suitsat Returns in Short Horror Film. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on March 13th and 14th will devote a speaker track to AMSAT and the world of amateur radio satellites. For more details on the lineup of presenters at the Ham Expo, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The Expo is in full planning mode and promises many exciting new things for the upcoming event, which will include a world-class lineup of more than 60 speakers and workshops for beginners to experts. Presenters at nine AMSAT sessions will discuss the broad spectrum of ham radio satellites, including introduction to amateur radio satellites, getting on the air with satellites, how to enjoy amateur radio contacts with the International Space Station, and debris mitigation in Earth's orbit. Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, an AMSAT board member, said working with satellites is one of the most rewarding privileges of holding a ham ticket. There has never been a better time to be involved in amateur radio satellites, she said, since some long-standing regulatory burdens have been lifted and advanced technology has never been more affordable and accessible. We have opportunities now that weren't available even a few years ago. AMSAT is fortunate to contribute to the Expo by showcasing the truly amazing work going on around the world in amateur radio satellites. And the Expo is the ideal partner to show it off to the wider ham audience. AMSAT will have a booth at the Expo where attendees can talk to experts, enthusiasts, operators and technicians, and obtain contact and membership information for the 30 AMSAT societies around the world. Early bird tickets are $10 to help cover the cost of the event and $12.50 at the door. That includes entry to the live two-day event as well as access during the 30-day on-demand period following the event. Register on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website.
The Orlando Hamcation has announced it will sponsor the Hamcation QSO party over the February 13th and 14th week in UTC to create a fun way for amateurs to celebrate the Orlando Hamcation experience over the air. Hamcation QSO party will be a 12-hour event on Hamcation weekend. Hamcation 2021 was to host the ARRL National Convention, which will now take place in 2022. The QSO party will replicate the camaraderie and social experience of attending Hamcation and provide a way to have fun on the radio since Hamcation 2021 will not be held due to COVID-19, the Hamcation QSL party committee said. The Hamcation QSL party will run from 1500 UTC on February 13th until 0300 UTC on February 14th. It will be a CW and single sideband operating event on 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Any station may work any other station. Categories will be high power, more than 100 watts output, low power, 100 watts output or less, but greater than 5 watts, and QRP, 5 watts output or less. All participants will be single operators. There is no multi-operator category. The exchange will be your name, state, province, country, and the outside temperature at your location. We are including temperature at your QTH as a way to highlighting Orlando's mid-February weather, the committee said. Nine Hamcation special event stations with one-by-one -one call signs will be on the air with combined suffix spelling out Hamcation. Each contact will count as one point and stations may be worked once on each band and mode. Answers will report their scores on the www.3830scores.com. No logs are required. Final results will be based on the information submitted to the website. Station guest operators must use their own calls and submit their scores individually. Plaques and certificates will be awarded. Meanwhile, the Orlando Hamcation Special Edition online event over February 13th and 14th weekend will take place of what would have been Hamcation 2021 in-person show. The online event will include youth technology contesting and vendor webinar tracks. The ARRL will also prevent two webinars on Saturday, February 13th. They are the ARRL member form at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, moderated by ARRL Southeast Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB, Amateur Radio Emergency Service presentation at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, moderated by ARRL Director of Emergency Management Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW. The ARIES presentation will include panelists from the ARRL Section Emergency Coordinators in Florida. Live online prize drawings are also scheduled during the Hamcation Special Edition online event. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. The Over the Horizon Radars reports that Over the Horizon Radars have increasingly been finding spectrum on 17 and 15 meters. Above all, the Russian Over the Horizon Radar, known as Container, as well as Over the Horizon Radars from China, continue to affect amateur radio more and more, sometimes quite massively, said Over the Horizon Radars newsletter editor Peter Jost, HB9CET, in the December edition with three or four such signals showing in the same band. Significantly fewer FSK transmissions, as well as the characteristic CIS-12 signals from the Commonwealth of Independent States, were to be found. For some time now, a broadcast station is active every day at 1100 to 1258 UTC at 7200 kHz, just said, adding that the signal appears to be coming from Taiwan. The broadcast station Voice of Broad Masses from Eritrea can be heard daily on 7140 kHz and increasingly also on 7180 kHz, he added. Occasionally, better conditions during November 2020 revealed fishing buoy signals and an Iranian over-the-horizon radars on 10 meters. The Chinese over-the-horizon radar, nicknamed Foghorn, was and is a daily troublemaker, Josh reported, back in November. Amateur radio on the International Space Station, or ARIS, and its partners are troubleshooting a failure with the onboard NA-1SS amateur station in the ISS Columbus module. The problem does not appear to be with the radio equipment in Columbus. However, ARIS realized the problem when a contact with a school in Wyoming between ON-4 ISS on Earth and astronaut Mike Hopkins, KF-5LJG, 
at NA1SS had to abort when no downlink signal was heard. Today was a tough one for Eris. Eris International Chair Frank Bauer, KA3HTO, began in a message on January 28th to the Eris team. Bauer explained that during a January 27th spacewalk to install exterior cabling on the ISS Columbus module, the current coax feed line installed 11 years ago was replaced with another built by a European Space Agency and Airbus. It included two additional RF connectors to support the commissioning of the Bartolomeo payload hosting platform installed last spring on Columbus. On January 26th, prior to the extravehicular activity, our Columbus Next Generation radio system was shut off and the ISS International Coaxial Cable to the antenna was disconnected from the ARIS radio as a safety precaution for the EVA, Bauer said. During the spacewalk, an external four-connector coax feed line replaced one with two RF connectors. The change was made to allow the European Space Agency to connect Eris and three additional customers to Bartolomeo as compared to Eris and one additional RF customer, Bauer explained. With the spacewalk completed, the ISS crew restarted the ISS ham radio station on January 28th, but no voice repeater or automatic packet repeater system downlink reports were heard. During a scheduled school contact at 1746 UTC, no downlink single was heard either, and attempted contact had to be terminated. Clearly, there is an issue, Bauer continued. More troubleshooting will be required. It may be the new external RF cable that was installed during yesterday's EVA. It might also have been caused by the connect and disconnect of the interior coaxial RF cable so the interior cable cannot be totally discounted just yet. Bauer said the crew photographed the coaxial cable and connector attached to the ARIS radio inside the ISS. Because the exterior cable is a Bartolomeo cable and not an ARIS cable, we are working with ESA and NASA on a way forward, he said. NASA has opened a payload anomaly report on the issue. We have talked to both the NASA and European Space Agency representatives. Bauer said Eris has asked the Russian team leader Sergei Zambarov, RV3DR, if Eris could temporarily use the RS0 ISS radio in the ISS service module for school contacts that are already scheduled until Eris can resolve the issue. On behalf of the Eris International Board, the Eris delegates, and the entire team, I want to thank all of you for your tremendous volunteer support to Eris, Bauer said. We will get through this and be more resilient as a result. We have reported where the Dayton Hamvention and the Orlando Hamcation have canceled in-person events again this year. It appears that not all organizers of amateur radio events are looking to cancel their plans for 2021. Mark your calendars for now because a pandemic safety and hygiene plan has been drawn up to enable Ham Radio Friedrichshafen to take place between June 25th and 27th in Germany. Details have been released by organizers and the DARC who are hoping to avoid the second cancellation of the largest amateur radio convention in Europe. The safety procedures are outlined on the event website and give details about mask and disinfectant use as well as cleaning, distancing, and contact tracing that will be taking place. The procedures also outline other ways to avoid contact which include the absence of greeting rituals and cashless payment for anything purchased. More details will be released later this spring. Youth on the Air, month of success in the Americas and around the world. December was Youth on the Air month 2020, and it was a great success in the Americas. For more details on this year's Youth on the Month, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, at League Headquarters. Youth operated amateur radio stations operating under the Youth on the Air or Yoda banner in the Western Hemisphere, contributed more than 14,600 contacts to the annual worldwide event, which celebrates youth in amateur radio. Two dozen operators under the age of 26 used special event call signs to promote youth in amateur radio in the Americas. Four one-by-one -one special event call signs, K8Y, K8O, K8T, and K8A, we're on the air rotating among participating operators. This marks a more than 11% increase in the contact count 
from last year's total of nearly 12,500. Pennsylvania teenager Michael Lippert, W3MLJ, said his favorite part of Yoda Month was running five radios at once, all on digital modes. Fifth grader Kalen Rizmiller, K8MTJ, said he got a kick out of logging ZR1ADI in South Africa on 20-meter FT8. Globally, more than 137,000 Yoda Month contacts were logged under the 46 call signs that hams younger than 26 put on the air. That surpassed last year's record number of 129,029. The U.S. placed second behind Croatia in the total number of contacts made during the event. Using lessons from Youth on the Air Month 2019 make organizing more streamlined and flexible for our operators this year, said Bryant Roskell, KG5HVO, who coordinated the events of the 24 operators and their logs. As part of their responsibilities, he also managed Logbook of the World accounts for U.S. stations, the QRZ.com profiles for all the call signs, maintained an operator schedule, worked with Youth on the Air Month manager Tommy Varro, HA8RT, and reported to the Youth on the Air Camp Committee in the Americas. December Youth on the Air Month served as a prelude to the first ever Youth Ham Camp hosted in the Western Hemisphere. The event was tentatively scheduled for July 11th through the 16th of 2021. More than 2,100 operators of all ages received awards based on the number of Youth on the Air contacts made. Unclaimed awards can be downloaded. Additional statistics are also available. All Youth on the Air Month QSL cards should be requested via OQRS on the Club Log website, where registration is required. More information about Youth on the Air in the Americas can be found on the Youth on the Air website. Originating from Albany, New York and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I'm here to counsel you. I'm the Dr. Laura of computing. I'm here, <laughs> I'm here to make you feel better about your pathetic hardware. No, I'm here to tell you that your hardware is not your enemy. It's your friend, even though it's mean and nasty and breaks all the time. I'm here to help you find new hardware. I'm here to spend your money. I'm here to save you money. I, you know, I'm here to do it all. Our new, uh, forums forums are back baby do you remember forums it's funny some of the people in the forum are saying this is kind of like the old days of bbs's you remember those you probably know oh you have to be of a certain age to remember uh dialing in with your your phone line and you'd get online <laughs> i'm old enough i remember actually actually picking up the handset on my Western electric phone and jamming it into rubber cups. That was the modem. And then, you know, mom would pick up the other end of the, on the extension and go, mom, get off the line. I'm on the, uh, I'm on the internet. Well, I, we didn't call it internet, do we? I'm on the BBS, BBS, the bulletin board system. So, uh, but they're back in a way. And I think some of this is because we all abandoned, didn't we? We all abandoned all of the stuff, the good stuff that we had, started in the I started at BBS in the 80s but in the 90s and later where the internet came along and all of a sudden Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and took over from these things these centralized uh, forums and mini blogs that became you know where you hung out but I think there's a little backlash isn't there now to uh, to these big guys cuz they're they're kind of I don't know they're, it's like it's like saying I'd like to talk to my friends in the middle of Grand Central Station, please. It's just, they're busy. There's a lot going on. So we started a forum uh, last week. It's done very well. It's like the old days of, uh, of forums or BBSs where you go, you create an account, and you say hi to people. And it's not a lot of people. It's maybe a thousand other people. And it's kind of people you know, you get to know over time and chat with them. And you can post pictures. And you can do the same stuff you would do on Facebook or reddit or even twitter but it's but it's a little more it's a small community instead of grand central station it's petticoat junction it's a little a little place where you where you can hang out the address for that is uh, community.techguylabs.com alphabet is grounding loon you know when you name a project loon because it's kind of crazy 
you shouldn't be too surprised if it doesn't go anywhere. It was what uh, Google and then later Alphabet calls a moonshot, uh, a, a long bet, a crazy idea that probably won't go anywhere. But, hey, we're going to do it anyway because we have so much money that we can do things like this. What was Loon? Well, uh, the idea was to give the entire world Internet via balloons, big old balloons circling the uh, globe that would kind of, I guess they'd have a ground station beaming up to the balloon and then back down to you. They launched it, you know, a long time ago, 2013. The balloons were not just, you know, party balloons. They were really kind of, you know, fancy weather balloons that got, went up, way up into the stratosphere and stuff. So they, they actually got to the point where they would be up there for months, years. Kind of hard to control where a balloon goes, but I guess the idea is if we launch enough of them, <laughs> I don't know. They used it in Peru after a big earthquake there. Remember after uh, the Hurricane Maria, they used it in Puerto Rico to give them internet access. They were actually doing it last year in Kenya. But now they've decided to ground loon, to pop the balloon, if it, if you will. The guy who heads these projects, he's part of the, the Google X project, their moonshot factory, they call it, has a very appropriate name, Astro Teller. He uh, actually said, you know what, time to pop the balloon. We we probably should just stop. But he, you know, to be fair, he said, when I heard about it the first time, I only gave about a 1% or 2% chance of succeeding. So, you know, you know, there was a, it was a moonshot. It was a long, long bet. Part of the problem is, you know, when they started doing this, the Internet only reached about three quarters of the Earth. And so there was a lot of other people that could be served problem they found got to 93 percent but the problem they found is that the remaining seven percent either couldn't afford the technology to get the signals like the the fancy phones or didn't even want the internet <laughs> we don't need that yes believe it or not in fact i find this extremely encouraging about seven percent of the planet doesn't doesn't really care so and that plus the fact that Elon Musk is launching 12,000 satellites to do the same thing and they'll be a little bit more robust. Jeff Bezos's uh, Blue Origin wants to do something similar. There so there's other people kind of handling this. Cool technology, giant balloons called the Loon, aptly named but it's uh it's over. Oh. Google actually is uh, in the news, too, because of Australia. There, uh, There's a bill. It's not yet been voted on in the Australian, what do they call it, parliament? I don't know, the Australian legislative body that would charge Google and Facebook for the, you know, when you search for a news story or you look at a news, you know, Google News or whatever, you get a little one or two lines from the article that they're referring to and then a link and you can read the rest. Seems to me a good thing. For the publishers, you know, that you get a taste of flavor of the article. Uh, the publishers say, no, you can't do that. In Australia, they want money for it. Rupert Murdoch leading the charge for this. If you're going to put snippets from our articles, you got to pay us, Google and Facebook. Now, it's not been, you know, voted in yet. It's a proposed legislation, proposed law. Mel Silva, who's Google's managing director in Australia, testified in front of a Senate. Oh, they call it the Senate. There you go. Committee that the proposed code was untenable, would set a dangerous precedent. And finally, she said, if you were to pass this law, it would give us no real choice but to stop making Google search available in Australia. Wow. That's like, that's the nuclear option. Yeah, fine. Go ahead. Do that. You won't have us to kick around anymore. I saw some people say, yeah, fine. Good. Let's make Google less powerful, less of a monolith, less dominant. I mean, it is really true. I, you know, in the U.S., I don't know. I think Google's only about 75% of all searches, but it's closer to 90% in much of the world. It's That's a monopoly. And if, if something isn't on Google, it's almost like it's not on the Internet. It doesn't exist. How do you find it if it's not in Google? Now, I know there are other choices. There are lots of other choices. And that's why some people say, well, this is a good thing. Force people in Australia to use other things like Google, like uh, Microsoft Bing or DuckDuckGo or Start Page. Yeah, there are other choices. Apple just added a new uh, search engine option on the iPhone called Ecosia. 
It's a search engine that plants trees. Yeah, I'm not kidding. Eco. They, uh, they're based in Berlin. They donate 80% of their profits to organizations that focus on reforesting and planting trees. Ecosia. The problem with Bing, DuckDuckGo, Ecosia, and the others is their results. The search, you know, that's why Google's so popular is because when you search for something on Google, you pretty much get what you want, right? The results are useful. That's why Google completely dominated the search industry when, you know, 15 years ago, it beat Alta Vista and uh, there were a ton of other search engines now long forgotten. There was one that began with an L. Lycos. Remember that? No, no one does. Because Google came along and what was it? You know, I mean, that's the truth. Somebody has a monopoly. It's because people want what they got and Google's free and it does a good job. But, you know, so we'll see. I mean, I, if you were in Australia, if maybe you are an Australian and you lost Google, I guess you just say, well, that's, you know, not ideal, but we'll use DuckDuckGo or Ecosia. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it's it'll be, we'll watch with interest. How about that? <laughs> I will be watching with interest. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about? I mean, we get a lot of calls. We did, actually, uh, last year, towards the end of the year, because people had seen that, Adobe Flash was going away. You know, that's the technology that gave you dancing monkeys on the internet for so many years. In fact, when when uh, YouTube first started out, the videos on YouTube were in Flash. But Adobe uh, kind of ran into some headwinds with Flash. For one thing, it was kind of notoriously insecure. People had all sorts of security issues with it. But for another thing, uh, Apple, Steve Jobs who kind of had an axe to grind with Adobe for other reasons, published an open letter on the front page of Apple.com way back in 2010 saying, we're not going to support Flash on our iPhones or on our iPads because we don't like it. It's it's a pig. It's slow. That was 10 years ago. It took 10 years to finally kill Flash. And December 31st, Flash went away. Adobe stopped using it. And we got a lot of calls from people saying, what am I going to do when my, my website is going to work and my game? And I think by now, probably, it's only the oldest sites, sites that haven't been updated in years that are still using Flash. And frankly, those probably won't ever be updated. They're abandonware. But most sites, I mean, YouTube stopped using Flash years ago. Funny story, though. <laughs> There's a railway system in northern China, Dalian, that was running on Flash. The whole railway system... Uh, they've known, we've known since 2017 that Flash was going away, but apparently whoever is running this railway system, the China Railway Shenyang, wasn't paying attention. By the way, I, Flash is a programming language. I guess you could do things like run a railway on it. I wouldn't want to, but you could. So the in, for 20 hours, the, sh the railroads in Dalian and Liaoning province in <laughs> northern China weren't running. Staffers couldn't view train operating diagrams. They couldn't set up scheduling. They couldn't arrange shunting. Basically, everything stopped. How'd they fix it? They got a pirated version of Flash and they installed it at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> everything started working again. <laughs> That's probably the most extreme example of, we're not giving up Flash ever. They're running a pirated version of flash oh my anyway i'm glad you were here and i'm here and i'll be here next week and i hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech leo laporte the tech guy are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history i'm bill Continelli, w2xoy and i'll be back in a moment with another edition of the ancient amateur archives here on this week in amateur radio now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. November 15th, 1945, the day that amateurs had waited for ever since December 7th, 1941. Finally, after three years and 11 months of wartime radio silence, Amateurs were allowed back on the air. Granted, we didn't have everything back yet. The initial authorization allowed amateur operations on 10 meters from 28 through 29.7 megacycles, 5 meters from 56 to 60 megacycles, and the new 2 meter band at 144 through 148 megacycles. 
and there were restrictions on these limited frequencies. Our old pre-war 5-meter allocation was temporary. The new post-war band was shifted to 6 meters from 50 to 54 megacycles, but the actual transition would not take place until March 1st, 1946. So, we were back on the 56 to 60 megacycle segment for only three and a half months. On the new 2 meter band, the frequencies from 146.5 through 148 megacycles were unavailable within a 50 mile radius of Washington, D.C. and Seattle, Washington. The military was still using these frequencies as well as our 160, 80, 40, and 20 meter HF bands. The military also occupied our new UHF and microwave allocations. It would be months, maybe a year or more, before the armed forces would fully vacate our bands and return them to us. But amateurs didn't care. Unlike 1919, when there was open hostility to us by the military and the threat of our elimination, the post-World War II armed forces, as well as the FCC, were fully aware of the tremendous assistance that amateurs had given throughout the war, and they were eager to give us back our frequencies. The ARRL was working closely with the FCC and the military to get our bands back. One band, however, was apparently not coming back. Our 160-meter band, the birthplace of our post-1912 operations, was fully occupied by the military with its new Loran radio navigation system. The armed services and the FCC made it clear that this segment was to remain for the use of Loran. Over the years, the FCC obtained small concessions, a 25 kilocycle segment here and there, 25 watt power limitations, day and night restrictions, but from the 1940s right up until the early 1980s, our 160 meter band sounded like a huge broad banded buzzsaw as Loran completely dominated it. But this was a minor blot on the landscape as amateurs rushed to get back on the air. 10 meters was the band they went to first, and the 28 through 29.7 megacycle range became crowded with those making up for lost time. Two meters was next. Hams modified their old two and a half meter equipment to operate on the new band, and soon the rushing sounds of the super regenerative receiver were everywhere. The more adventurous were trying out something called FM. Five meters was quiet. Since the band was available for only 105 days, many hams spent that time converting their rigs to the new six meter band. On March 1st, 1946, our old 5-meter band died, and the new 50 to 54 megacycle segment was born. Also on that date, to compensate the amateurs for the loss of 29.7 to 30 megacycles, we were given an 11-meter band at 27 megacycles. That's right, the present-day CB band was once an amateur allocation. By May 1946, we had our 80 and 75 meter allocations back. We also had a temporary allocation from 235 to 240 megacycles, which would soon be shifted down to 220 to 225 megacycles. On November 2nd, 1946, the FCC finally released our 40 and 20 meter bands. By the end of 1946, we had our full HF spectrum back, 80 and 75 meters, 40 meters, which was CW only, 20, 11, and 10 meters. Note that there was no 15 meter allocation then. Our 15 meter band did not appear until 1952. The military restrictions on our 2 meter band were lifted in June of 1947, and except for 160 meters, the military was off of our bands. By 1947, every amateur band from 80 through 2 meters was full of stations. But there was trouble brewing. Amateurs weren't the only ones taken to the airwaves. Television was growing by leaps and bounds. In 1946, there were only 7,000 TV sets. In 1947, the number jumped to 180,000. And by 1948, there were over 1 million TVs in use. Amateurs who were used to harmonically related bands and an empty VHF spectrum were not prepared for the TVI their neighbors were experiencing. A typical unshielded amateur transmitter operating on 14, 28, or 50 megacycles could wipe out all the TVs in the neighborhood. QST ran a series of articles on proper shielding and filtering of stations, and hams gradually learned to eliminate harmonics from their transmitters. But there was one band where shielding and good design didn't seem to help. Six meters. 
Our 50 to 54 megacycle segment was sandwiched right between TV channel 1 from 44 to 50 megacycles and TV channel 2 from 54 to 60. At that time, only channel 2 was actually being used for TV. The channel 1 range was still part of the old pre-war FM band from 42 to 50 megacycles, which was being phased out in favor of the new 88 through 108 megacycle allocation. We were causing interference to WCBS and other handful of stations on Channel 2. And the problem would only get worse when Channel 1 became available. Tests were run and an interesting solution was proposed. Because a television video signal is amplitude modulated, operates with a wide bandwidth, and uses the lower portion of the TV channel, it was determined that Channel 2 was twice as susceptible to interference from a 6-meter station than Channel 1 was. The ARRL's proposal to the FCC, eliminate Channel 2, keep Channel 1. But this idea didn't sit well with the stations already on Channel 2, nor did it win the approval of Major Armstrong, who was still fighting the grand battle to keep FM broadcasting in the 42 to 50 megacycle range. And so, in August 1947, the FCC withdrew Channel 1 from the TV allocations. By the end of 1947, all the pre-war FM broadcast stations had disappeared from the 42 to 50 megacycle range, which was then turned over to public service. Amateurs learned to operate in the lower portions of 6 meters to avoid TVI to Channel 2. In our next installment, we are going to look at a major upheaval that began 40 years ago and pitted amateur against amateur and, according to some, the ARRL against hands. I'm talking about incentive licensing and how it changed the entire licensing structure. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, January 29th, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that solar activity increased this week. We saw no sunspotless days, and the average daily sunspot number rose from 14.7 to 28.1. The average daily solar flux was up also from 76.1 to 77.2. Average daily planetary A indices rose from 4 to 9.4 due to a minor geomagnetic storm which occurred on Monday. On that day, Alaska's high latitude college A index was 33. Predicted solar flux for the next few weeks is 76, 75, 74, and 74 on January 29th to February 1st. 72, 70, 70 again, and 72 on February 2nd through the 5th. 76 on February 6th to the 10th, and 77 on February 11th to the 20th. The predicted planetary A dice is 5 and 8 on January 29th to the 31st. 18, 12, and 8 on February 1st through the 3rd, respectively, 5 on January 4th through the 6th, 10 on February 7th and 8th, and back down to 5 on February 9th through the 19th. Now the AMSAT report. AMSAT is continuing to assess the status of the RAD FX SAT-2 or FOX-1E amateur radio CubeSat, after a ham in Nevada reported hearing his CW signal weekly via the spacecraft's transponder on January 27th, AMSAT Engineering and Operations was able to confirm the reports from Brad Shoemaker, W5SAT, and determined that RAD FXSAT-2 is partially functioning, although signals are extremely weak. Nothing has been heard from the satellite before this. AMSAT said that while it appreciated hearing from those who were also able to detect their own or other signals in recent passes, it asked that stations not try to transmit through the transponder until further notice. The next crucial step in evaluating the condition of RAD FX SAT 2 is to determine whether or not the 1200 BPS telemetry beacon is operating and, if possible, to copy telemetry from the beacon. The AMSAT report comes to us every week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Paperwork and equipment checks have kept some members of the Rebel DX group occupied since their arrival in Cape Town, South Africa in early 2021. The team writes on the DX News website and their Facebook page, the Beauvais trip is on track. They report that they are going forward with the 2021 DX expedition 
in spite of not yet having full operating budget, noting that they are not applying to any DX foundations or clubs for assistance. Polish D Expeditioner Dom 3Z9DX has organized this trip, which is the team's second attempt at the sub-Antarctic island, one of the most coveted DX on the planet. The Expeditioner's first attempt in 2019 was scrapped by the ship's captain after a severe cyclone swept in, damaging the vessel and making a safe landing unlikely. Meanwhile, there are reports in the Ohio Penn DX Bulletin that Dom 3Z9DX has been heard on the air from South Africa recently, operating from Cape Town as ZS Slant 3Z9DX. He has been heard on 80, 20, and 17 meters. QSL via the club's log, OQRS. Here's the current listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Please note that the webinars are a member benefit and that this schedule is subject to change. Easy Helical Copper Tape and PVC 2-meter vertical antenna hosted by John Portune, W6NBC. Learn how to quickly build a tiny 18-inch continuously loaded lightweight portable or base station 2-meter omnidirectional vertical with performance and efficiency comparable to a 5-foot J-pole. All you need is some hardware store copper tape and PVC pipe, and the cost is roughly $10. It's an easy afternoon's homebrew project, ideal for the new ham, but equal to the experienced ham's needs. It's great for events like bikeathons. It also makes an excellent ham radio club hands-on building project, and the design is adaptable to other bands. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. Interesting stories about ham radio and weather spotting, hosted by Rob Macedo, KD1CY. One of the most critical ways amateur radio supports agencies such as the National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center, and Emergency Management is through weather spotting via the National Weather Service Skywarn program. This presentation reviews some interesting stories about how amateurs involved in Skywarn have saved lives and property and why this is an important amateur radio activity. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern or 0100 UTC on Friday, February 12th. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW Tour, hosted by Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, W1AW Station Manager. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW, located in Newington, Connecticut, was established to honor the memory of ARRL's co-founder and first president, Hiram Percy Maxim. Although the first radio station of the ARRL was actually located in Hartford, Connecticut and active as W1MK, W1AW in Newington is known worldwide and considered the radio station most associated with Hiram Percy Maxim. Formally established in 1938, nearly two years after the death of Hiram Percy Maxim, W1AW has consistently been on the air, save for the time when the station was ordered off the air by the FCC due to World War II. This guided tour will provide an inside look at W1AW and will be led by station manager Joe Garcia and J1Q. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, February 18th, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern or 2030 UTC. Talking to Astronauts, an elementary school's exciting Aries experience. Hosted by Diane Warner, KE8HLD. This is a story about Talmage Elementary School's participation in a once-in-a-lifetime Aries school contact. you learn about their amazing journey leading up to the amateur radio contact with an astronaut on the International Space Station. The excitement of the entire experience was shared not just by the students, but included faculty, parents, the community, and local amateur radio operators. You also learn how to begin the process of submitting your own Aries contact proposal. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. Visit the ARRL Learning Network webpage for more information. The Quarter Century Wireless Association is looking for an amateur radio operator who doesn't just love radio, but has a talent for finance and numbers too. In short, the nonprofit group is in search of a treasurer to fill the post left vacant last year. The treasurer is responsible for preparing the proposed operating budget for approval by the board of directors. The treasurer also provides the board with quarterly income statements along with a year-end income statement and balance sheet. 
The treasurer's responsibilities also include preparing the necessary paperwork at tax time, which includes the proper documents for the employees and contact workers, and the federal tax return, among other forms. Members who are interested should contact Ken VE6AFO at president at qcwa.org. In 2020, a project between AMSAT UK, AMSAT NL, and Swiss universities got underway with the aim of equipping two Swiss satellites with linear amateur radio transponders. Linear transponders permit several CW or SSB contacts to take place simultaneously within a prescribed passband. The satellites also include features for classroom demonstrations and experiments. The so-called CHESS project, that stands for Constellation of High Energy Swiss Satellites, includes two satellites which will be built simultaneously and later launched as a constellation. The main science objective is to improve understanding of the upper atmosphere by taking advantage of a constellation of identical satellites to study the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and its density. The amateur radio payload is a joint project of AMSAT UK and AMSAT NL, launch is not expected until the fourth quarter of 2022. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. Ralph Holler, N4RH, started his ham radio journey as a nine-year-old with a knack for electronics leading to his first amateur radio license. Within a few years, Ralph earned a broadcast engineering licenses, radio station jobs, an education, and finally a career at the Federal Communications Commission. N4RH was a driving force behind many of the FCC initiatives that have had a lasting impact on radio amateurs in the USA and around the world. N4RH is my QSO today. N4RH, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Ralph? Hi, Eric. It's Ralph. Yes, I am. Ralph, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? That's a little bit of a difficult question. I have to say I had an interest in radio back probably even before going to school. My folks used to tell me that they couldn't keep me away from electronic things. I, I would I would take flashlights apart and, and move Christmas tree lights from one plug to another and sort of anything that had to do with the electricity had my attention. And then when I was about eight years old, I met a ham radio operator. His name was Orville Stremple, W0UPU, now a silent key, but went over to his house and uh, he fired up the rig, and we talked uh, to a number of stations, and I thought, this is pretty neat. So that led to me getting novice license in 1959 and ultimately upgrading to extra, and I've been licensed ever since. Did Oroville give you the test at that time, the first test? No. Actually, the test was given. I, I took a uh, course that was given by the local radio club to get the novice license, and the instructor of that course is the one that actually gave me the test. I see. And what was the hometown? Topeka, Kansas. And the radio club? Caw Valley Radio Club. Caw Valley, like K-A-W? K-A-W, yeah. It's the, the, there's a river that flows through Kansas called the Caw River, and so the club was named after that. And how old were you in 1959 when you got your novice license? I was nine. Wow, that's actually, for those days, that was pretty young, I think. Yeah, like I say, I, I was really interested from an early age. It, it was fascinating and got my attention. Do you remember what your first call sign was? K-N-0-Y-M-A. I think in those days it was good for a year? It was good for a year, and then I, I tried upgrading to general. In those days, you had to go to the FCC office to do that, which was, for me, Kansas City took the test, and uh, the first time I took it, I, I failed the code, and the second time I took it, I passed the code and failed the written, and the third time I took it, I finally passed it and got my general. And that was within that year period of time? 
Actually, it started in that year, and and ultimately, by the time I got to general, it was like six months after the novice had expired. So, I guess technically, I haven't been licensed continuously, but but I tried to be. No, but technically, you were ten years old when you got your general. That's true. Yes. That's very impressive because I think in those days, I remember taking the general at sixteen years of age, and it was pretty hard. Well, I, I went on, and as soon as I got the general class, there was no advanced in those days. It was general to extra. But I didn't go that route. I then started on my commercial licenses and got my third class commercial license, radio telephone license, when I was 12, upgraded then to second class, and got my first class radio telephone license when I was 13. So you have a first-class radio telephone license at age 13. Were you needed in Topeka, Kansas by any of the radio stations there to be their engineer or to at least sign logs? In fact, I became an engineer at one of the local radio stations when I was 14, still in high school. Worked there part-time uh, as a transmitter engineer, ultimately a combination engineer disc jockey. Then when I left for college, I went to a different station. I went to the University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas, and became chief engineer of the local commercial station there, KLWN. Did that for two years and then went back to KEWI in Topeka as chief engineer. Spent the, the rest of my time working my way through college uh, as chief engineer of that station and then did broadcast consulting for a while, built a few stations around the country, and uh, ultimately went to work for the FCC in uh, late 1970. Here you are, age 9 as a novice, and then age 10 as a general. It sounds to me like your parents were quite supportive of your efforts to become a radio amateur, even taking you to Kansas City to get your license exams. What was their attitude? Well, supportive is is the right answer. They thought that, that it was... Uh, a good thing for me to get involved with. Uh, frankly, by the time I was nine, I had already made the decision. I don't want to, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this, but I'd already made the decision that my career was going to be as an electrical engineer. And they thought that this was a good opportunity for me to get some experience and also to, because of the radio club, to get to know people who were working uh, as engineers and, and technicians in, in radio and television mostly. They thought it was excellent for me to, to start getting involved uh, in these kinds of activities at that age, given what I thought I wanted to do with my life. This was kind of the age of Sputnik as well, right? So that there was a lot of excitement about radio in those days? Absolutely. I had my receiver and, and I tuned it in and listened to it. Okay, so what was the first rig as a novice? I had a Halicrafter's S85 receiver that my folks bought for me, and I built a novice transmitter out of the ARRL handbook. As I recall, it was three tubes. And uh, built it and put it on the air. And my whole novice career, I made two contacts. The first contact that I made was with the FCC monitoring station in Grand Island, Nebraska for second harmonic radiation. I was on 80 meters, but they heard me a little above 40. And my second contact was with ARRL official observer in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Same situation. I turned the transmitter off and did not turn it back on. But still you weren't discouraged and you went on to get your general class license. Absolutely, yeah. It didn't discourage me, although I was concerned about going to jail if I kept the transmitter operational. So you upgrade to general a year later. Did the rig improve at that point? Yes. At that time, again, my folks were supportive, and they uh, got a Viking Valiant transmitter, which was an AM, CW AM transmitter, about 200 watts. And so I, I, I had that, and I never received any more violations. So it was probably a good thing to quit using the one I made. And were you active on the air, and were you on CW or phone? I was on both, and yes, I was active on the air. There was a group of teenagers that started an, a 40-meter net. We met every Saturday morning. I checked into that regularly. Some evenings after school, we would get together and, 
and talk. And I was also active in the local radio club, very active on two meters. The two meter activity originally in town was basically simplex with converted commercial equipment that had been taken out of service because the commercial equipment had to be narrow banded from 25 to, to uh, 15 kilohertz deviation. So there was a lot of commercial equipment available and then uh, we eventually got a repeater in town and I, I was active in that. So yes, during most of that time I, I, was, I was pretty active. This goes to my early interest in commercial equipment as well. Do you remember what your two meter rig was? The first one was a Motorola 80D, which uh, was actually two separate units, transmitter and receiver separate, that hooked together with big cables, and the transmitter had a dynamotor in it, so uh, when you had it in the car, you used it and pressed the button, the, light, the headlights dimmed. But uh, it worked, and I got it on the air, and then eventually got uh, an RCA unit, and it was uh, surplused from the railroads. Topeka was a, well, actually the headquarters of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway. One of the people in the club was with the railroad, and he was able to get most of us in the club uh, some of this surplus equipment that they couldn't use anymore at a very reasonable price. So got that, and and had a couple of units on the air. Then I used the ADD as a base station and used the RCA as a mobile. Continued using that actually for several years. You are listening to an interview from the QSO Today podcast with Ralph Haller and 4RH, conducted by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG. We thank Eric and the QSO Today podcast for the use of their program here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Yeah, I love that stuff. I love the smell of that stuff. I'm a little younger than you, so I remember the Motorola T-Powers, the GGTs, things like that. Well, the interesting thing about the ADDs is they had Loctal tubes, which were, were pretty interesting. I, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They had little tiny pins. They looked like a regular octal tube, except for the smaller pins. And when you pressed them into the socket, they really snapped in. And I guess they were made because they were concerned in a mobile environment that if they didn't have that, the tubes would fall out with the vibration. That was the only reason I could figure why they made them. But they, it was interesting, interesting units and certainly uh, gave me a lot of experience in terms of converting them from the commercial frequencies down to the amateur frequencies, getting them on the air. So a lot of my interest in amateur radio has really been more on the technical side, learning about electronics more so than communications. Uh, it's, it's okay to, to talk and I don't have any problem with that, but my real interest has always been more on the technical side of it. I understand that completely. I think that's what I do as well. Let me ask you, as a 14-year-old first-class radio telephone licensee and engineer at a radio station, how were you regarded by adults who were your peers at the radio station as a young engineer there? I was rather fortunate in that the station that I worked at was a top 40 station. And the majority of the people working there were relatively young. Certainly, there were only a few people that were over 30. The owner, one of the engineers, most of the other engineers were actually college students that were going to the University of Kansas and working at the radio station on a part-time basis. So it's not like I was working, uh, I was 14 and working with a group of 50-year-olds. I was working with a group of 20-year-olds for the most part, eight, you know, 18 to, to 25 for the most part. So it's not like I was that much different in age, and I certainly never felt that there was any kind of animosity about my age and, and my working there. I, I was accepted and enjoyed, the, enjoyed it. Now, you received a degree from the University of Kansas? Yes, Bachelor of uh, Science in Electrical Engineering. And did you go on for advanced degrees after that? Uh, I did some work towards an advanced degree, but actually I, I never completed an advanced degree. 
You mentioned earlier that uh, you ended up at the FCC. How did you begin at the FCC? Well, it was a little bit by accident. Uh, after I left the radio station as chief engineer, I went to work for a broadcast consultant in town, and we built radio stations, uh, mostly in the Midwest, uh, and also did maintenance on them. And one of the things we had to do in those days, when you were going to put a new station on the air, you actually had to go to the FCC field office, and you had to identify any other FCC licensed facility within two miles of your proposed location. So I was at the Kansas City FCC office one day, and I was going through, in those days it was actually note cards, to, to try and locate other stations for a new station that we were putting on. And the engineer in charge there, who I, I got to know, who by the way is the person who failed me in my first ham exam, but I got to know him quite well, actually. He came in and, and said, uh, you know, we're hiring right now. Have you ever thought of possibly working for the FCC? And I said, well, not really. I, I hadn't ever really thought about it. And he said, well, why don't you fill out this application? And we'll just send it in, and, and maybe they'll want to hire you. Yeah, I recommend working for the FCC. I've been here several years, and, and I think it's a great place to work. So I said, fine. And I filled it out. I heard nothing for several months, probably six months. And all of a sudden, I got this letter in the mail from the FCC. And I opened it up and looked at it, and it was travel orders to go to Los Angeles, move to Los Angeles. But nothing in there actually indicating that I had been hired just travel orders to go to Los Angeles. So I called up and they said, oh yeah, nobody told you the Los Angeles office wants you to come to work for them. And I said, well, no, I, nobody told me. Uh, well, do you want the job? And I thought about it and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I'll take it. And so my wife and I packed up and uh, moved to Los Angeles and started working in the field office there and just thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a decision that it's one of those pivotal decisions in one's life that it was the right decision at the time and it made it was a decision that affected the rest of my life. So yeah, I, that, it was by accident sort of that I got there, but I'm glad I did it. And you were in the Los Angeles field office from what years? Late 70 through 76, mid 76. I'm sure that there's a number of hams listening to the podcast that probably took their amateur radio exam under your proctorship. Undoubtedly true, because not only did I give exams in Los Angeles, we had Arizona as part of our territory. So I, I gave exams in Phoenix and Tucson, and we also gave exams in Bakersfield, California. So anybody that took exams in any of those places during those years, there's a reasonable chance that, that I gave them the exam. And if they took a commercial exam, there's a, whether, no matter whether I gave the exam or not, there's a reasonable chance that my signature appears as the issuing officer on their license. I was quite in, involved in that, although that was really only one aspect of the job, but I gave commercial radio telegraph, radio telephone, all the amateur exams, and one of the things that we had to do as an examiner is we had to know Morse code at 25 words per minute and pass it at our own test at the 25 words per minute. So it required knowing Morse code and, and basically required, well, knowledge of the, the exams, you know, the content and all. So presumably everybody that gave FCC exams was able to pass FCC exams. Now, the San Diego office, was that handled by somebody else? I remember that there was an FCC office in San Diego. Clarence Spillman was the engineer in charge of that office at the time, and he was, uh, that's actually a sub-office of the LA office, so he reported to the engineer in charge in Los Angeles who reported to the Field Operations Bureau in D.C. Well, that's where I took my general class exam. We were worried about parking in Los Angeles at the time if you can believe that, in 1973. 
Let's move on. I remember in the 80s when cellular telephony was beginning, and I was involved in the two-way radio industry at the time, and so therefore, you know, I was following cellular telephony. And there was this idea that somehow cellular was going to be different than PCS, that for some reason these would be two different services. Maybe PCS was going to have handsets. But it's my understanding that in 1994, you were appointed by then the FCC chairman, Reed Hunt, to lead the FCC's task force on PCS issues. Now, what happened to PCS, and why don't we hear about it now? Well, it's still there. It's just mostly a terminology thing. Technically, cellular radio operates in the 800 megahertz band, and PCS operates uh, in the 2 gigahertz band, 1.8, 1.9, 2, now up in, in 5 gigahertz. But PCS was intended to do two things. It was intended to use higher frequencies where you could have more bandwidth. And it also was intended to provide, as a result, I should say, to provide more capacity for particularly data kinds of services. And so there's not a lot of difference between cellular and PCS, primary differences being the frequencies upon which they operate and the bandwidth of the modulation technologies that are used. Cellular tended to be, at the time, basically traditional FM, whereas the PCS services we're moving more towards a spread spectrum sort of technology. So again, the, to the end user, there's probably not a lot of difference. And there's no reason that an end user should know any difference in terms of how they use the equipment. But from a technology standpoint, PCS, I would have to say, is, is like a more advanced cellular system. So I remember in the time, and I get it, I get the idea that in those days we were evolving out of VHF, UHF, mobile telephone services that were quite elite. Rich people and business executives might have had those telephones. As you say, they were FM. And I remember the first cellular telephones that were marketed were also FM phones. So I got this idea, at least it seemed to me at the time, that it's possible that in those days people would have two wireless devices, one a cellular phone, and perhaps as PCS evolved, that that would be like a data handset if we were even thinking in those terms at that time. Was the FCC under your task force, were you guys thinking in those terms at the time that possibly there could be something like an iPhone, a computer that people carry in their hand? Yes, absolutely. That was the idea, to uh, even begin providing video services, which seemed almost impossible to think about it, but that was the idea, to provide advanced services like that. And in fact, we held hearings to talk about what PCS could provide. And I will never forget that one of the people who appeared before us in the, in the hearing said, you know, this is going to evolve into something that ultimately is going to be implanted, and you won't even be carrying a device. And that's always hit me as that we're not there yet. But it, it seems like as things progress, we're getting more and more to the point of where devices are becoming uh, very much in tune with human activity. And uh, I, I, I think back to, I wonder if there will be a day when we don't really talk about devices anymore. We just, we think about communicating and the device takes over automatically and connects us. And I, that's, that's where he was headed. I don't know, I'm still a skeptic on that, but it's, it's certainly a vision that is interesting to think about. Probably the reason we don't think or hear about PCS now is that all of these lines have blurred. And so we now carry one device. I think with the recapturing of analog television channels that created some vast open spaces for these data networks as well? Yes, definitely. The, the spectrum 
is definitely becoming more available for these kinds of services as a result of the repacking of TV. Though the services are also becoming more efficient. They're able to get more and more data into a particular bandwidth. And so you've got both things happening, the FCC making more spectrum available and the technology being more efficient in transmission of information. So you take the two and we've come to a point where we can get a whole lot of data over a relatively small amount of spectrum anymore. Yeah, it's quite amazing. I think the first computer I ever programmed was an IBM 370, and that took an entire floor of a building at school. And now I think I'm carrying in my pocket probably uh, 100 buildings of IBM 370s. It's really quite amazing. It is. I go back to my college days, and to program a computer, we had to sit down at a key punch machine and punch a deck of cards and then take them to the computer center, hand them in. They would run them overnight, and we get the results back the next day. Think about that to where we are now, where you sit down in front of a computer and everything is instantaneous. It's been a tremendous change. You're a little bit older than I am, but I also started on cards, but we could get ours processed in the time it would take to go buy coffee and drink it. Then you go back and you get your report, right? And you look and you'd see that you had a syntax error on card number 50. And so then you'd have to do the whole project over. Fix the card, push the deck back in, and then go get another cup of coffee. It made me learn to hate computers early on. That's exactly what happened to me. There wasn't instant gratification in those days. And the people that stayed in computing, God bless them, because it's why we're where we're at now, but I think I was an early dropout to computing because of the time it took to get a reply. Exactly, and I was very resistant on uh, getting involved in computers again. I really didn't want to do it, and ultimately I had to, and and things had changed a lot by then, and it was a lot more user-friendly, which was okay, although I still find them pretty frustrating when they don't work, and you have to troubleshoot what's wrong. But that being said, I don't see how we would get along in this today's environment without them. How did your role at the FCC, how did that evolve after that? When I left Los Angeles in 76, I went to D.C., and my first job for a couple of years was in the inspections branch where all the field offices, uh, I mean in the investigations branch, all the field offices would send their investigations, usually interference or unlicensed activity, and we would review the reports that came in and decide if there should be a fine or you know, what action should be taken or if the case was resolved and should just be closed. And then I moved from that to chief of the monitoring station network. We had, in, in that time, 13 monitoring stations around the country, one of them in, in Puerto Rico, one in Hawaii. And I was in charge of that for a couple of years. Then in 1980, I went to the FCC's laboratory in Columbia, Maryland, and I was in charge of research at the FCC for three years. 83, I went back to D.C., and I worked in the policy and rules division of the Broadcast Bureau. And then from that, in 86, I went to the Private Radio Bureau and spent the rest of my career there and ultimately as, as chief of that bureau. And that is the bureau that licenses almost everything that's non-broadcast, non-cable, and non-common carrier, which means police, fire, amateur, boats, aircraft, anything that, think of the two-way services, and, and basically it licensed all of the two-way kinds of services. Now, were FCC monitoring stations in those days manned by human beings, or were those like remote monitoring? They were all staffed 24 hours a day. I remember that there was one in Southern California, right? Maybe in Santa Ana or in Orange County somewhere? Santa Ana, you're right. Those are very interesting places. How do they do it now? Is there FCC monitoring stations around the country still? I'm not an expert in what they're actually doing now. I believe that 
some of those stations remain open and they are operated by remote control. And to the extent that they still have field offices, I believe the field offices have at least VHF, UHF direction finding capability and some remote locations that they either dial into or can access through the internet. But I, I'm not directly involved with that and don't really know what the current configuration is, but I think it's something similar to what I just described. When you were running the Private Radio Bureau, how important were amateur radio official observers to helping you keep at least the amateur radio portion of it clean? I didn't really ever have any direct interaction, so I, I can't really give you an answer to that question. I certainly was aware they were out there. I knew that they were, they were doing a job to help keep the amateur radio service in check, but I never received, really received reports from the ARRL on how many people they would send notices to and all. I just, I knew they were there and I, I knew they were doing good, but I couldn't quantify it in any way. Can you recall any major enforcements against an amateur radio operator during your tenure there at the FCC that perhaps is quite memorable to you? I really don't want to go into specific cases, but I would say the, the majority of issues that became problematic were with amateurs who were intent on causing interference. For one reason or another, they were either just cantankerous or they would get upset with somebody else and trying to find and resolve interference issues was a problem. Some amateurs uh, also would get involved in uh, setting up unlicensed broadcast stations and so we'd wind up having to find those stations and close them down and then take action against the, their amateur radio license. But that was primarily it, interference issues. And occasionally we would find somebody operating illegally in some way, overpower. That tended not to be a great problem in the amateur service. That was much more a problem in the citizens band service where they were limited to five watts and people would go in and find them running 300 or 1,000. So really uh, most of the enforcement was much more on the citizens band side than the amateur side. In the end, did the FCC ever create some spectrum for would-be broadcasters? I remember pirate broadcasters in Southern California. I was never one, but I knew some. It seemed to me that there was this compulsion to play records on the air. They couldn't help it. Did the FCC ever make some kind of spectrum available for this? Yes and no. Under Part 15 of the FCC rules, which is the part that licenses or that regulates all of the unlicensed activity, there are provisions for low-power broadcast stations, both in the AM band and the FM band, and there are limits on power and limits on antenna length. If someone complies with those requirements, they can put a station on the air, but it doesn't have a particularly long range. So yes, there is a provision whereby you can do it, but you can't serve a whole town with it. Are you still with the FCC now? Or are you retired? What's your current status? I left the FCC in 1996, and I became a consultant primarily in the land mobile services, police, fire, emergency, medical, and the business radio services and taxi cabs, and helping people design radio systems and get licensed by the FCC. And did that till 2012, at which time I took a position at, uh, in frequency coordination. The FCC certifies frequency coordinators in the various public safety and business radio services. And I started working for the Forestry Conservation Communications Association, which is one of the certified public safety coordinators. And I continue to do that now, although I'm 
just part time now. I'm, I'm uh, general manager of that operation, but I've gone to part time. I'm basically about 90% retired today, but I know I have not been with the FCC for 20 some years. Ralph, in 2009, you received the Barry Goldwater Amateur Radio Award for unique contributions in the field of amateur radio. What are those unique contributions that you made to the field of amateur radio? Well, I was very honored to receive that award. I, I had the great opportunity to meet Barry Goldwater since he was from Arizona, and that was part of our district when I was in the field office. But uh, I, I was very honored to receive the award, and there were perhaps a number of things that went into it. It's, it's more like a Lifetime Achievement Award, I guess. But some of the specific things that I, at least I'm proud of is I implemented the vanity call sign system while I was chief of the Private Radio Bureau. I also was instrumental in the first volunteer amateur exams at Dayton, Ohio. We worked with the local radio club and we actually went out there, gave the exams to the volunteers, let them give the exams and we sort of monitored the whole thing. And from that, proceeded into the volunteer exam program that we have in place today. I was also instrumental in getting uh, frequency coordination for amateur repeaters as part of the VHF, UHF operations for amateur radio, which at one point there were a lot of repeater wars, uh, people saying this is my frequency and somebody else saying it's my frequency. and Getting frequency coordination into amateur radio, I think, was a, a big step forward. And I also uh, felt that the, the Morse code requirement had kind of become obsolete, and so started the process of reducing and eliminating Morse code requirements to become an amateur. So those are all sort of things that I hope went into the Barry Goldwater Award. They never tell you for sure, but I think those are some of the things that have had a, a pretty big impact on amateur radio, and I think a, a, a positive impact on amateur radio, both in letting people get their own call signs and in also encouraging people to come in. I think Morse code was a big detriment for a while to people coming into the to be amateurs. So those are some of the things, at least, that I've done over my career that I think are important to amateur radio. Well, you know, what's interesting about the loss of the Morse code requirement, I actually think it was a good idea, but it appears to be now that there's a higher percentage of amateur radio operators who are now operating Morse code than there was before. I think that's kind of a funny thing, actually. When you're required, I think it's human nature, when you're required to do something, you resist it. But when you're allowed to do it, if you want to, you're more inclined to do it. And I think that may be just uh, uh, something related to human nature. I have a theory on it. I've interviewed a lot of hams. Your episode is 328, and so I've interviewed a lot of hams who operate Morris Code and continue to operate Morris Code or have gone to Morris Code. And I think that part of the idea that they want to do this now is because I think we're so inundated with visual and audible information that just sitting down for an hour and having a conversation on CW, there's some kind of zen about it, some kind of meditation that goes with that that's kind of a break from the routine where we're just completely bombarded all day long with news and information and noise and everything. What do you think about that? I think you've hit on something because when you're operating on Morse code, it requires a full commitment. And there are a few people that can operate a key and listen to what's coming over the air and still talk to somebody in the room. I know one of them who I was always amazed could do it. But for most of us, if you're on Morse code, it's a full-time commitment to carry on that conversation. and completely blanks your mind of all the other stuff, and I think it can be a very relaxing activity. There should be another book at some point. I'm sure someone will write it, like Zen and the Art of CW Operation. I like it. You are listening to an interview from the QSO Today podcast with Ralph Haller and 4RH, conducted by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG. 
We thank Eric and the QSO Today podcast for the use of their program here on This Week in Amateur Radio. What's the current rig? The current one is pretty small. I just have an ICOM mobile, a, tri a, a dual band, a two meter 440 unit in the car and use it when I'm in the car. I don't actually have anything set up at the house. I'm in a deed restricted community and that limits what I can actually do here. So I'm sort of more content with just the mobile operation and not particularly active on the air these days, I have to admit. What's the First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, and what's your role in it? I don't have any specific role in it. It is a network that uses spectrum that was provided by the FCC. It is a network that is managed by the federal government, the uh, National Information and Telecommunications Association, NTIA, part of the Department of Commerce. It is a broadband nationwide network for first responders. And the only thing that I have to do with it at all is I'm also chairman of the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, which is a group of public safety trade associations. It's an informal federation of these that come together and help to develop standards for public safety communications, both technical and operational. And to that extent, that organization has provided quite a lot of input into the development of FirstNet, again, both in terms of technical operation and in terms of the, the policies, uh, how, how the network gets implemented. It's strictly advisory. It, it's, not a, it's not a part of FirstNet. It's strictly advisory to FirstNet, which FirstNet can choose to follow or not. Is FirstNet actually deployed across America? I mean, is there really a nationwide network? There is. The FirstNet issued a contract to AT&T to build the network, and AT&T has built out the network nationwide, although there are still major gaps where it's not available. Interestingly, the area where I live, uh, at and -T service is basically non-existent. But it's still a work in progress, and they are going to build it out, and it is going to serve the first responders nationwide. But uh, it's not totally built out yet, but there's certainly a, a lot of it that is built out across the country. Does that mean that there are FirstNet handsets that are used on this network? There are. I can't get too deeply into this because I'm truly not involved in FirstNet. So I can't uh, really talk in terms of specific equipment at all. There's supposed to be a variety of equipment that meets the common air interface requirements of the FirstNet system, but I cannot tell you what's actually out there that people are using, although I do know that they, the system is deployed and people are using it. As a person who's involved in national public safety issues, do you think that public safety is missing its simple VHF, UHF channels? Well, I think we have to step back and say, what is the function of FirstNet? FirstNet was intended to be a broadband data network deployed nationwide. It was never intended to replace the traditional land mobile VHF and UHF systems. Most of those are still in operation. A number of them are expanding because they are the last resort. Most of them are hardened. Not all of the FirstNet facilities are hardened, but most of the critical land mobile systems that are used by public safety are in sites that have backup generators, they're in bunkers, and they continue to operate under the worst of conditions. That is simply not true of the broadband networks. They may or may not continue to work in all situations. So to suggest that public safety has given up its VHF and UHF I think would be wrong. It continues to use those and 800 megahertz. 
and most localities would not be relying on the FirstNet network for their day-to-day -day voice dispatch kinds of communications at this point. Maybe they will someday, but not today. Do you think that the sophisticated systems that public safety is now using across America and across the world, that they become so siloed that if there's a fire burning between two cities, they can't coordinate it because they're talking on different channels? I like to think we're just the opposite of that. When 9-11 happened, there was a big concern that one department couldn't talk to another. It was interoperability was a big problem. And frankly, it wasn't a technical problem. It was more a problem of a human problem in that each entity really didn't want others to be able to listen to its conversations. And so we had a silo system that was very intense. 9-11 changed that to where more and more people, one, got on trunked systems in the 800 megahertz band that allowed everyone to communicate. And beyond that, even the VHF and UHF systems started putting in gateways so that one system could talk to another. And then FirstNet came along, which makes it possible for anybody that's on FirstNet anywhere in the country to communicate. And so I like to believe, and I really think it's true, that we have gone much more to a situation where every responder can talk to everyone else they need to. Did 9-11 change the approach by public safety organizations away from channel exclusivity and privacy? Well, what it did is it made everybody understand that communication between agencies is critical. And one of the big things that, that NIPSTIC has done uh, is, I, I mean, one of the things that, that we found was people even had radios that could talk to each other, but they didn't know it because the channels didn't have the same names. And so one of the big things that I think NIPSTIC has contributed to interoperability is giving common channel names to all of the public safety channels so that if one entity wants to talk to another, if they have the same channel name in their radio, they can both get on that channel and talk. Uh, I, that, to not be able to talk because you don't know you have the same channel is just inexcusable. So, I mean, that's just one of the things that, that we've done that I think has really helped interoperability in this country. Are amateur radio operators useful in emergency events? Absolutely. And I encourage amateurs to work with their local emergency management offices to be part of the operation because amateurs can also communicate when other systems are down. And they can provide essential backup communications. That's, it's not police dispatch, but it's providing information in an emergency back to an emergency operations center that's needed and necessary. So I really encourage amateurs to work with their emergency management agencies as much as possible to be part of that team. It's a little harder, I think, to get that expertise out to the general public, but if you're in an area and you've worked with community leaders to say, hey, we're a resource, we're here if you need us, that's another way that amateurs can get involved. When you speak to amateur radio groups, what perspective would you bring to the amateur radio community that should be heard? I think I try to have a theme that amateur radio can be lots of things to lots of people. And if you want to get involved in amateur radio, you should take advantage of all of that. And whether it is improving your technical skills, improving your, your uh, communication skills, improving your public service skills. Any of those things, amateur radio provides an outlet that, that you can do that. It's an outlet that allows people to learn, it allows people to grow, and it allows interaction with others that have similar interests. So my basic theme is that amateur radio 
has not outlived its usefulness. It's different than it was 50 years ago or 20 years ago. It involves other technologies like the internet today, but it's still an opportunity for people with a technical knowledge, desire of technical knowledge, to be able to, to get together with others to learn and to mentor. So uh, I guess that's primarily what I talk about, other than talking about my experiences at the FCC. The, the theme that I want people to understand is amateur radio is still viable. It's still a very wonderful way to expand one's horizon. Ralph, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed this. Uh, the time has gone by very fast for me. I, I hope it will for your listeners as well. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my experiences with your listeners. So thank you. 73. 73. AMSAT reports that it's continuing to assess the status of the RAD FXSAT-2 Fox1E amateur radio CubeSat after a ham in Nevada reported hearing his CW signal weekly via the spacecraft's transponder on January 27th. AMSAT Engineering and Operations was able to confirm the reports from Brad Schumacher, W5SAT, and determined that RAD FXSAT2 is partially functioning, although signals are extremely weak. We also appreciate those who joined in determining whether they could detect their own or other signals in recent passes today, AMSAT said in a January 28th bulletin. Please do not attempt to transmit through the transponder until further notice. This is very important to the next steps we are taking now. The next crucial step in evaluating the condition of RAD FXSAT2 is to determine whether or not the 1200 BPS BPSK telemetry beacon is operating and, if possible, to copy telemetry from the beacon. AMSAT continues to ask that those with 70 centimeter receive capability to listen on the beacon frequency of 435.750 MHz, plus or minus Doppler, upper sideband. Use the Fox Telem to capture any telemetry and set Fox Telem to upload to server so that AMSAT will receive the telemetry data. Recordings are welcome with a detailed description. AMSAT stressed that keeping the RAD FXSAT2 FOX1E transponder clear is essential to putting all power and attention to the beacon telemetry. Available data suggest that RAD FXSAT2 is Object M from the Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 Launch, NORAD ID 47320, International Designation 21-002M. We thank the amateur satellite community for their perseverance and assistance, while the AMSAT engineering and operations teams work to understand and resolve the situation with RAD FXSAT2, AMSAT said. YouTube recordings and PDF files from the 2021 Propagation Summit, hosted on January 23rd by Contest University, are now available. More than a thousand logged in for the sessions. Each presentation begins on the hour. You can advance the video to the presentation you wish to view. The 11 a.m. session, update on the Personal Space Weather Station project and HAM SCI activities for 2021, hosted by Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF. The 12 noon session, entitled Solar Cycle 25 Predictions and Progress, hosted by Carl Lutzenschwab, K9LA. The 1 p.m. session, called Maximizing Performance of HF Antennas with Irregular Terrain, hosted by Jim Brakall, WA3FTT. And the 2 p.m. session, entitled HF Propagation, What to Expect During the Rising Years of Solar Cycle 25, hosted by Frank Donovan, W3LPL. Slide decks are available for each presentation in the PDF format. The French Defense Ministry is in search for radio jammers that can be drone mounted. The government's Defense Innovation Agency has put out a request for proposals in search of a small, low-power warfare device that can find radio communication transmitters while mounted on a fixed or rotary wing drone and possibly disable the signals through jamming. Proposals were due no later than the 18th of January, and demonstrations of prototypes will follow over the course of the next seven months. The devices are expected to be capable of detecting any number of transmitters operating between 30 MHz and 6 GHz 
and available to transmit their findings in real time to a receiving station on the ground. Bidding is being limited to companies within the European Union. During 2020, a project between AMSAT UK, AMSAT NL, and Swiss universities got underway with the aim of equipping two Swiss satellites for now under the chest name with linear amateur radio transponders. Linear transponders permit several CW or SSB contacts to take place simultaneously within a prescribed passband. The satellites also include features for classroom demonstrations and experiments. The CHESS, our constellation of high-energy Swiss satellites project, includes two satellites which will be built simultaneously and later launched as a constellation. The main science objective is to improve the understanding of the upper atmosphere by in situ measurements, taking advantage of a constellation of identical nanosatellites to study the composition of the terrestrial atmosphere and its density, the CHESS website explains. The first satellite will have a nearly circular orbit and an altitude of 400 kilometers. The second will have an elliptical orbit with an altitude of anywhere between 350 and 1,000 kilometers. The amateur radio payload is a joint project of AMSAT UK and AMSAT NL. A successful review of system requirements was completed in December. Launch will not take place until the fourth quarter of 2022. The Intrepid DX Group is seeking nominations for the individual or group that most display their intrepid spirit in 2020. For the purposes of this award, an intrepid spirit is bold, courageous, dedicated, innovative, fearless, generous, resolute, and visionary in their approach to amateur radio, the organization says. We want to recognize those individuals or groups that activated the rare and difficult dangerous places in 2020, exhibiting an unshakable commitment to the amateur radio DX community. Deadline for the 2020 nominations is February 15th. Submit nominations via email to intrepiddxgroups at gmail.com. It is given in the memory of James McLaughlin, WA2EWE slant T6AF. James was a retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. He was shot to death in April 2011 while working as a contractor for the U.S. government in Kabul, Afghanistan. The board of directors of the Intrepid DX Group will evaluate the nominations and the award will be presented in May 2021. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. In the last three segments on the subject of pr promoting your ham radio club's event, we covered making a successful public service announcement. In this segment, we'll look into where to send your PSA once it's ready to mail. I'm always collecting addresses for local media outlets. No matter how long I've looked, I'm always finding new places to get free advertising for our local ham radio clubs. In the library, or at most radio stations' business offices, you can find a thick paperback book called The M Street Directory. This is a good reference for names, fax numbers, and addresses of radio stations in North America. Most states have a broadcaster association and books of addresses and other contact information. Engineering firms who provide technical services to the broadcast industry also keep these books and would no doubt let you copy the pages to begin your collection of local media outlets. For your club's fundraising promotion, I would suggest posting notes in grocery stores, laundromats, schools, libraries, the nearest National Weather Service office, and neighborhood bulletin boards. Mail copies of your PSA to all local radio stations, TV stations, cable TV offices, newspapers, technical vocational schools, on-campus radio and TV stations, and even the local Radio Shack store. As an extra incentive, when you mail your PSA to your local radio and TV stations, include several complimentary admission tickets for the station to use as they see fit with no strings attached. This both allows them to give them away to listeners or offer them to station staff who may also someday become hams and join your ham radio club. If your local radio station is truly active in the community, you can invite them to broadcast live from your event if they want to. They can do this with minimal cost and equipment, sometimes requiring nothing more than a cell phone and a station logo on a banner. 
So always be looking for new ways to promote your club's fundraiser. In my opinion, in today's computer automated world, the more you automate, the more you mail, the more you collect addresses, the easier and faster you can promote next year's event. Over a period of years, with good record keeping, you can turn promotion to a matter of updating last year's PSA, which is still stored in your computer, with the correct date, printing new flyers and PSAs, new address labels, and within 30 minutes, the entire effort can often be a few keystrokes and mouse clicks away from completion. This is Greg Stoddard reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. While we normally think of skywarn activations during tornadoes and hurricanes, winter storms also require what's called ground truth. These are actual reports from the field to confirm what meteorologists are observing on radar and with other instruments. While spotters can report by phone, email, or online, those from the amateur radio community can also communicate such things as snow depth and ice accumulation to meteorologists quickly and efficiently through local repeater nets connected to the Weather Services office. Christopher Strong, Warning Coordination Meteorologist for the Baltimore-Washington Weather Forecast Office, states, Reports of snow and ice are vital to keeping the forecast on track. Automated reporting stations are great at detailing temperatures, rainfall, and winds, but do not report snow and ice accumulation. So, spotter reports really help us see how much is accumulating and match it up with how much we expected through that time. Reports from radio amateurs and other spotters help the National Weather Service save lives and property in the community and minimize the impact of severe weather on the public. To find out more about becoming a Skywarn spotter, please visit the Skywarn page on the National Weather Service website and click on the link to contact the Warning Coordination Meteorologist in your area. What began in 1921 as the Radio Society of Christchurch in New Zealand is now a robust club of enthusiasts known as the Christchurch Amateur Radio Club, ZL3AC. The club has traveled a long road displaced by earthquakes in 2010 and 2011, but is now happily ensconced in Pendleton. Members are marking the 100-year journey by operating as ZL100RSC throughout February and offering an informal award to anyone who contacts the station on VHF, UHF, HF, or through digital voice reflectors, repeaters, Earth Moon Earth, and satellites. For the award, hams must contact ZL100 RSC, which is worth 25 points. 10 points may also be earned by contacting the club station ZL3AC. Individual Christchurch club members are worth 5 points each. February 15th is a bonus day. That's the 100th anniversary of the club's first meeting, and on that day, all points earned are being doubled. For more details, visit the QRZ page for ZL100 RSC. That's Zulu Lima 100, Romeo Sierra Charlie. Foundations of Amateur Radio. This podcast began life under the name What Use is an F Call? and was renamed to Foundations of Amateur Radio after 206 episodes. To mark what is effectively this, the 500th episode, I considered a retrospective, highlighting some of the things that have happened over the past decade of my life as a radio amateur. I considered marking it by giving individual credit to all those amateurs who have helped me along the way, by contacting me, documenting things, asking questions, sharing their experiences, or participating in events I attended. Whilst all these have merits, and I should take this opportunity to thank you personally for your contribution, great or small, to amateur radio, to my experience, and that of the community. Thank you for making it possible for me to make 500 episodes, for welcoming me into the community, for being a fellow amateur. Thank you. During the week I received an email from Sunil, Victor Uniform 3 Zulu Alpha November, who shared with me something evocative, with the encouragement to bring it the attention and appreciation it deserves. By way of introduction, on the 13th of June 2002, Ken, Whiskey 6 November Kilo Echo, became a silent key. Ken was an amateur, an active one by all accounts. I never met Ken, but his activity list is long and varied. Ken became interested in ham radio as a teenager in the 1930s. 
He was a long-time advocate of CW, and during World War II he taught Morse code to Navy operators. In 1975, he founded the Sherlock Holmes Wireless Society and was editor of its newsletter, now called the Log of the Canonical Hams. He received his investiture from the Baker Street Irregulars in 1981. Ken was an early member of the International Morse Preservation Society, or FISTS. He held number 0818. He was the president of Chapter 2 of the Old Old Timers Club, the OOTC, for many years. In addition to drawing cover art, Ken also wrote lots. 7.3 magazine features plenty of Ken's articles with titles like Inexpensive Vertical, Don't Bug Me Dad, and The DX Hunter. Ken was also a poet, which brings us to the way that I think is appropriate to mark the 500th episode of this podcast. I'm confident that you can relate to this contribution by Ken to Amateur Radio published in Volume 1, Number 3 of 7.3 magazine in December 1960. The Vagabond Ham by Ken Johnson, Whiskey 6, November Kilo Echo, Silent Key A vagabond's life is the life I live, along with others ready to give, a friendly laugh and a word of cheer to each vagabond friend both far and near. I travel the airwaves day or night, to visit places I'll never sight from the rail of a ship or from a plane, yet I'll visit them all again and again. I never hear from a far-off land that my pulse doesn't quicken. With careful hand, I tune my receiver and VFO dial to make a new friend and chat for a while. Africa, Asia, they're all quite near, in as easy reach as my radio gear. With the flip of a switch, the turn of a knob, I can work a ZL, a friend named Bob. There's an LU4, a fellow that's grand, who's described to me his native land, till I can hear the birds and feel the breeze as it blows from the slopes of the mighty Andes. I learned of the surf and a coral strand, the smell of hibiscus where palm trees stand, neath a tropical moon, silver and bright, from an FO8 that I worked one night. I thrilled to the tales of night bird screams in the depth of the jungle where death-laden streams flow neath verdant growth of browns and greens from a DU-6 in the Philippines. The moors of Scotland, a little French shrine, German castles on the River Rhine. Of these things I've learned over the air without ever leaving my ham shack chair. There's a KL-7 on top of the world to whom the northern lights are a banner unfurled that sweeps across the Arctic night, makes the frozen sky a thing of delight. Tales of silver and gold and precious stones, ancient temples and moulding bones, where the natives, I'm told, are tall and tan by an XE3 down in Yucatan. My vagabond trips over the air will take me, well, just anywhere, where other vagabonds and I will meet from a tropical isle to a city street. My vagabond's life will continue, I know, through the fabulous hobby of ham radio, and one day, from out at the world's end, we'll meet on the air, my vagabond friend. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. And finally this week, the popular American TV show Last Man Standing is preparing to go QRT. When the show wraps up its final day of shooting this spring, it's going to be saying farewell ham radio style. The primetime show, which became a showcase for amateur radio through its main character Mike Baxter, KA0XTT, is leaving the air after nine years, but not before it first gets on the air on the amateur bands. 
Executive producer John Amadio, AA6JA, said that a big farewell special event station is planned for KA6LMS between March 14th and March 30th, the last day of the show's production. At that point, the mailing address of the Last Man Standing Amateur Radio Club will also change to 11684 Ventura Boulevard, Suite 810, Studio City, California, 91604. The show grew even more popular after star Tim Allen made things real by getting the call sign KK6OTD. It also features guest radio operators on the set during meal breaks. John went on to say that rather than have it slip away silently, we should have one more activation of KA6 LMS now. With operators from the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club, the K2H Special Event Station, and the 12 Days of Christmas, the activation will give everyone a last chance to work KA6 LMS in an ambitious special event. Be listening on CW, SSB, D-Star, DMR, RIDI, PSK, and FT8. Consider it one last hurrah for Last Man Standing. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesque in Brunswick, New York. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.